Howie, lovely to see you, pal. You too, Glenn. How's it going? Yeah, not not bad. Yeah, we've just uh, had a had a, a minor inf- jump into a dental surgery this week, which wasn't which is never complete fun. But I have an excellent dentist, so he mm-hmm. he did a good job, and hopefully he caught it in time. But um, I think there was an interesting lesson in in that for putting things off and weighing up relative risks, which seems to be something that everybody's talking about at the moment. So. Mm. <laughs> and, and and what was it like to sit, to be in the presence of another human? Uh, yeah, lots of them as well. Yeah, yeah, it's fine. It, it, it was it was good. Obviously, uh, if you're going to go somewhere. Um, and worry about aseptic technique that dentist is actually a pretty good place to go because like, as a matter of course everybody's always got masks and everybody's keeping everything aseptic so it's a so it's it's a it's a pretty safe place to be and interestingly he was talking about that he's basically smashed right now he's a good friend of mine as well um and uh, my dad says this and he runs a couple of dental surgeries in raleigh north carolina and uh he said that so many people just for the whole of the isolation procedure i mean obviously he wasn't i think for a, for a while they weren't allowed to do anything elective right they they could only do like emergency dental surgery basically or like real problems and they couldn't do anything that was kind of a choice like yeah you've got a cracked tooth it's kind of getting bad yeah. but you can put it off for a little while uh, and he said that so many people put things off that should not have been put off and now they're coming now it's just emergency cases back to back all day long just like just you know trying to fix things in people that would have been fine if they'd come in four weeks ago you know so it's a so it's an interesting kind of um argument there about relative suffering <laughs> at some point so uh-huh. a, little, a little monsters grow up to be big monsters yeah something like that yeah definitely mm-hmm. but yeah other than that it's um i mean it's it's been a roller coaster as it has for everybody i guess you know we've um there's there's been lost income there's been um there's been opportunities in the in the crisis and there's been the roller coaster with, with the family and juggling kids and trying to homeschool them at the same time that you're working and all that kind of stuff and uh but i think psychologically we've been through the same phases as everybody else like uh, we talked a bit about it last time on the last podcast that we had that it's akin to grief right that you at the beginning it's just kind of like a, a fear and panic stage where you're like how am i going to get how am i going to pay the mortgage what's going to happen are we sure this thing doesn't infect kids you know all that kind of stuff um and then you get more information and then you move into kind of um for a while you're just annoyed at the world and annoyed at the government or annoyed at the virus or whoever it is and some people are still tra- trapped in that denial phase i think but um but then you move through to acceptance and then we're in an interesting place right now and that's kind of what i'd like to talk about today a little bit in that not all of america but um big swathes of america are starting to at least dally with the idea of reopening and going back to some semblance of life before covid um but it's pretty clear that it's not going to be like life before covid you know um yeah. and we can get into you know the reasons why and all that kind of stuff but it's you know a lot of people more learned than us have talked about the economics of it and it, it, we're on new ground and all of that kind of stuff but but just that psychological idea of the light being at the end of the tunnel now we're not just resigned to being at home for three more months right we're, uh, we're people are starting to think well what's life going to look like now i'm going back to work even in some partial capacity um how much social contact and activity is is healthy versus selfish um and then people may be starting to hold themselves accountable for behaviors that they gave themselves a pass on for the last couple of months right so a lot of people have just gone into full netflix slob and not really done any exercise let any nutrition fall out the window um all those kinds of things they picked up a lot of bad habits and they've had a lot of time to pick it up and they're getting back on some others have gone in went into crazy exercise mode and you know crazy health mode and they've had lots more time to focus on it um but it seems like more people were kind of in the apathy phase of this whole kind of thing and of course you're a you know expert health coach and um you know, expert nutrition, you run exercise all the time. So clearly uh, your experience is going to be that uh, you did everything right, right? The family life is blissful. <laughs> Everybody's keeping optimal nutrition and exercise routines, right? I'm, I'm presuming that's how it's panned out in the, in the Jacobson household. Yeah, well, par- partly I grew the goatee because it makes my face look thinner as I was ballooning. <laughs> it just, just adds a little, a little optical illusion of, uh, right. uh, of length to, gotcha. the, to the cranium. Uh, but did, did you you stayed whole foods plant based though? You've just eaten more of it. Is that right? <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. Ish. I mean, it's interesting. You know, I don't. I know we don't want to make this a, a political statement, but there's other countries that are starting to reopen with plans and with yeah. with leaders uh, who are science based. And so, yeah. like, it might be the wrong decision, or anything I do might be. You know, we, everything is, is a risk and a bet, essentially. Sure. But it feels very different to when you read about like, here's why we're doing this. Here's 
why we're taking this precaution with nursing homes, and this is why these industries are beginning to open up, and why we think beaches are okay, but not concerts, mm. that, that, can, that can lend a little um, sort of ease and confidence. Because like one, sure. one of the problems is like, we're all on our own. It's like, you yeah. know, there's, there, you know, Elvis has left the business building, there's no daddy, there's no yeah. mommy, there's no one. And in a world in which expertise needs to matter. <laughs> yeah. Um, like, like my kids have started sort of like seeing other people and they tell me when they go out their social distancing. Yeah. But I, I, have, I have a suspicion that social distancing gets six inches less every time they go out. Sure. You know, yeah, there's, yeah. so there's a lot of slippery slopes mm. um, that I think we, we are we are be, we are beginning to navigate. And mm. it's, it's almost like, you know, every every time I go and do a dangerous thing and nothing bad happens, I'm I'm learning that it's not so dangerous. Yeah, it's, it's um, just on a neurological level and evolutionary biology level. We're not well equipped to deal with this. Right. And we're, it would be easier in some ways if this was like some hideous Motaba Ebola virus or something like some hantavirus. Right. That people bleed from their ears and eyes when they've got it. <laughs> it has like a 60 to 80 percent mortality rate. It, it's easier than to heed our kind of instincts for disgust and things like that right that's why we're kind of like turned off by people you know with skin rashes and stuff like that right it's it's, it's not a nasty cruel thing it's basically an inbuilt evolutionary tendency to stay away from sickness right we're trying to protect ourselves and our loved ones from catching that right, right. and it's not fair sometimes on people who just have harmless eczema and things like that right but at least in this kind of situation that helps but what we're dealing with now is something that's essentially incredibly contagious um, completely transmissible while people are asymptomatic, you know, or fairly as asymptomatic, it seems. There's a lot of it going about. Even though sneezes and things seem to be like still, sneezes and cough seem to be the major method of getting and, it about. And, to yeah. and public toilet flushes, apparently. Yeah, aerosolizes. Things. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. It's more than one good reason to stay away from public toilets right now. <laughs> but, um, but so we're not well equipped to deal with abstract threats like this. And what I'm seeing in the response to people, especially in America, is. There's no top down unified message. You've got like a, a 50 different news outlets all covering it in their own different way with their own little spin. And even at the top end of the government, again, I don't want to get too political about it. You've got, a, you know, one wing making a statement about it, like the Fauci and the scientists and all that kind of stuff saying, this is what we know. We don't know everything, but we pretty much know this. So let's go with this. Let's go through the pandemic playbook here. And then you've got the executive branch undermining what he's saying. And so people are like, who am I to believe here? What am I supposed to do? Am I supposed to do what daddy says or what mummy says? Um, so like kids, we're kind of playing them off against each other a little bit and just doing our favorite thing <laughs> right? Right. a little bit. Whereas in other countries, like you said, in Germany, Angela Merkel's a scientist. She's responding very, very um, flatly, very, very calmly about the whole thing. I think she addressed her public for the first time in her entire career on TV. Um, and, you know, in, uh, in New Zealand, um, what's her name? Jacinda? Ardern. Ardern, yeah. So it's been phenomenal and just been very kind of um, mothering in her approach to the whole thing and reassured people and sort of said, here's what we're going to do, here's what we know. And like you said, there, it's not that they're being, they've been any more extreme in some ways with the shutdowns. I mean, it's been easier to implement there because the citizens have been more amenable to it and less obsessed with freedoms, you know, basically. But um, but at least they've now they can look at reopening because they can kind of trust that people are going to do it in a semi um, unified way. But I, I think that's going to be very difficult to achieve here now because people weren't even unified in the shutdown, let alone unified in the way that we're going to, you know, come back out of it. And I think it is a slippery slope. And I think people are going to my my instinct and looking looking at the first few countries to open back up again, like South Korea and things like that, um, is that in two, three weeks, we're going to be back in isolation again yeah. because people will overshoot and it will just go blast and then people will be stuck indoors and no amount of protesting and whining about it is going to change that, right? It's, there's going to be more and more dead people in the hospitals and, and we won't have any right. choice, right? So, uh, yeah. so it's, um, it's, it's a difficult it's a difficult thing. Yeah, and, and like the, the common thread here with our habits is like as a health coach, the enemy is very often the slippery slope. Mm. Right. Like people tend not to dive headfirst off the wagon. OK, right? they're not like it's it like just all... starts, starts with an extra cookie here and there or like a day or two of skipping the running or whatever it's going to be. Yeah. 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 I, I see this so often that, you know, I'll talk to people and they've had a great 
uh, run of runs. Let's say you know I've got all right. I'm you know I'm running six days a week, six miles a day. I'm, I've got my regimen, and then they'll twist an ankle, or they'll go on a on a trip, or a family vacation, or get mm. sick, and all of a sudden it's like oh well, yeah, right. And there's this 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 reticence to just shake it off and pick right back up where where I was. And it, yeah. it doesn't it, it never feels like, OK, this is the moment when I have to make the momentous decision to stop doing it or not. And yet we see it. We see it in hindsight, like, oh, like I haven't taken I haven't meditated in six years. I used to, you know, or I, yeah. I used to journal every day and I my journal still says 2014 is for the last entry. Yeah, totally. And, so, and there's this weird there's this weird paradox at the moment as well, I think, in that. On the one hand, um, not all of us, you know, it, there's a very different experience between kind of blue collar workers who have public facing and pushing and pulling type jobs, of which I'm kind of partly one. I have a split job, right? Like part of my job is writing and um, writing and speaking and presenting, which some of which I can do online. And that's kind of filling the gap now for all of the you know physical stuff that I can't do. And we've, we've been doing lessons on Zoom with my physical practice that I have with uh, with my members there. And that's working out really well for about half the people right and the other half um are just they're either doing their own thing or they're not doing anything at all right it seems they've just dropped off entirely from systema training and they're just waiting for the somebody to pu to pu push the button and have us come back to training indoors again um but i think that's going to be a little way off so but anyways it's a little bit tricky in that we've got plenty of time and there's so a lot of us have got more time at least than we had in, in an enforced capacity. And so there's this kind of thing like, well, now you can be your best self, right? And now you haven't got work as an excuse pulling you away from it. Now you can start those good habits. You can do some gardening every day. You can get outside. You can meditate. You can do that kind of stuff. And then at the same time, we've got these stresses um, hanging over us, financial. What's what's the work situation going to be in like two weeks, three weeks, a month's time? You know, um, what do I do with the kids that are hanging around at home <laughs> before we had like six hours of practically practical daycare when people were going to school and now they're at homeschooling and and you realize that they've only actually got about an hour and a half to two hours of real honest to goodness work to do and the rest of the time they were socializing farting around having a good time and and they want to do it with you while you're trying to do other stuff which is yeah. difficult right for a, for about an hour that's fun and then you're like you know stuff to do here we got we got to move on you yeah. know so it's a, or actually for about a month that's fun and you can kind of pretend you're on holiday and then you're like now i have to earn some money because otherwise we yeah. can't continue living in this house so you've got this time and you've, you've got this impetus but the stress is driving us in a different direction the stress drives us towards comfort eating towards sessile behaviors like plonking in front of netflix for six hours hours at a time towards apathy towards anxiety and depression and it's kind of like a, a perfect storm of bad nutrition no exercise and immunosuppression that means a lot of people could come out of this sick right or overweight and sick of other things even if covid doesn't get them mm -hmm. you know the side effects of trying to combat it in a responsible socially healthy way might prove well, really really yeah. bad for them if you're not careful and there's there's a, a new genre of writing that i see more and more frequently which is like personal development shaming. Yeah. Right. right. Do you know what I'm talking about? Like, like from, I do. Exactly. Yeah. Well, what, well yeah. Tell, tell me what, what I mean by that. Cause, well, yeah. it's, I, I mean, it's, it just seems like people are drawing a bright line between two ways of being when you're facing a crisis, right? It's like you're either the kind of person that folds into crisis and just, and just, doesn't develop themselves and they just allow the situation to take care of them or you're you know you're owning this everything all of this is your responsibility and you have a responsibility to grow from it and do better and do well um instead of all the gray areas in between where we're like you know what we could cut ourselves a little bit of slack here you know we're under a lot of pressure and maybe the baseline is staying human staying healthy um and trying to stay calm and then everything on top of that is a bonus especially when you're in the kind of refractory period of just dealing with the changes that are happening you know and so there's, there doesn't seem to be a lot of um compassion for people in different situations and circumstances um and there's, there's a lot of this kind of jocko willink you know like how you do one thing is how you do everything kind of you, do you know what i mean yeah. <laughs> kind of push out there i don't i don't know if that's exactly what you meant but that's that's what sprung to mind yeah. when I was thinking, well yeah. the two things are one is I'll, I'll see editorials in you know papers of record times washington post they'll say like you know be gentle on yourself now is like now is not the time to necessarily learn a new language or learn a new skill like life is hard give mm. yourself a break have that wine and chocolate sure 
Um, and at the same time, you know, two columns over, there's a story about how people who are obese and with diabetes are more likely to die of the virus. Sure. Uh, and then I see in, in, in Facebook arguments about people saying, like, look, if you have the time, it's your responsibility to um, to make yourself better. Yeah. Um, Spend quality time with your family. You just, you just like just get that thing. And, yeah. Yeah. And then and then other people like, you know, I am I, I have PTSD right now and it's all I can do to get out of bed in the morning. And it really annoys me and offends me mm. when, when you tell me that this is a time for personal transformation and growth. So, so how have you resolved that in your household? How have how have, how have you responded yeah. to it and how have yeah, you know, has Mia and your kids, how have you responded? Yeah, well, you know, if you, as you said, like there, we're living in a world of of uh, polarization and bright lines and bifurcation. And like the problem with that is, as in with everything, we keep getting new information. Yeah. And, you know, this intelligence largely means when you get new information, you change your mind. Yeah. All right. So the the. The issue is, I think, given that we don't know what's going to what's going to happen, the the useful question is not like, is this right or is this right? But like, what do I want? Mm. And there's you know, there's always at least two answers to that question. Um, there's the you know, the now the present bias. What do I want? I want the biggest fucking piece of chocolate I can get my hands on. Yeah. <laughs> or, you know, what do I want? I want to be strong and healthy. I want to feel good tomorrow. I want to feel proud of myself and in control of my behavior. And, and you know what? Money's a little tight. So maybe it's the chocolate that goes and mm. and, and not the organic apples. Like, if, mm. you know, they're they're coming out of the same budget. So to, to really, uh, you know, as a coach, what I want to do is empower people to ask and answer that question from from a thoughtful, loving place. Yeah. Like, what do you what do you really want? And that's, mm. there's no difference between asking that question in people's regular stressful lives, because, people, you know, like binging wasn't invented in March of 2020. Sure. Yeah. It just got and a lot easier. <laughs> it got a lot easier. And then and we've gotten a lot more permission. Yeah. Right. But to to give what well, like the real permission I try to give my clients is to look into their hearts and decide who do I want to be. Yeah, that's, that's great advice, I think. And um, one thing that I might add to that is that we probably have to ask that question more often than we did before. Right. Whereas mm -hmm. maybe some people got into the habit of checking in with themselves, maybe once a quarter or maybe once a month, something like that, and be like, hey, am I on track here? Am I doing what I'm doing? Or am I letting this even this diet plan or this exercise plan just run away with me? Am I doing it for the sake of completing the repetitions or getting to X number on the scale or whatever it's going to be? Um, or is this really serving my purposes? And, and sometimes when you've done something for a few months and you're like, yeah, OK, I've you know, my muscles are very, very strong. I can do like 120 pull ups. Um, but what has that actually done for me? Actually, that's increased blood pressure to my head and upper body all the time and i'm walking around in a state of being a little bit sympathetically activated all the time you know uh -huh. from a stress viewpoint you've got more muscle it's being more fed and your and your butt your you know deep limbic brain is like what are you preparing for you know, <laughs> it's genuinely concerned about why you feel like the need to get ripped and and run really fast you know at the moment uh -huh. like in the midst of all and with the background of stress that's running and all the inputs that are coming in so after a while you might be like you know what maybe i need to focus more on meditation and less on pull-ups right and then you can do that <laughs> for a while and then you feel yourself kind of slobbing out the body's not being receiving as much attention as the mind and then you can flip around and it used to be that I, I guess in you know fair weather times you can ask yourself that question about once every three months maybe one to three months and you'll you probably won't go too far astray right you can course correct but right now as you said it seems like under covid that you know time has just it just blasts by, you know, it's as what well, the, the the events that used to happen in the course of a month are now happening in a day. And what used to be a month's worth of, of developments, economic, political, social are happening, you know, a year's worth are uh -huh. happening in a month, you know. So you have to ask yourself, like, at least once a week, I think, or maybe even like every every few days, you're like, how am I feeling about this? Is this working for me? You know, mm -hmm. is this generally working? And then you have to balance that with 
the consistency, right? You have to keep something going long enough. You have to build a good new habit in order to make any kind of change. But I think it's a dangerous time to try and put in any rigidity, right? So put in a new rigid set of routines that, that you need some structure, you need some routine, but you don't want to be too rigid because you don't know what you're preparing for. You have to try and make yourself psychologically, mentally, physically, emotionally adaptable. I think that's the single most important thing that we can do right now is make ourselves adaptable. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, two, two words come to two things come to mind. One is I used to teach online marketing. And mm. uh, one of the tools we used was split testing, where yeah. you have two AB a a <laughs> testing, you have a couple of different ads, and you see which ones work. And there were people who took that so to heart that they didn't understand anything about uh, statistical power. So every day they would run two ads and whichever one won that day, and it might be this one got three clicks and that one got two clicks and yeah. you say, oh, well, this is the winner. So it's it's important like not to just to uh, to say like, OK, this this is what I want today and tomorrow I'm going to change it on a dime. Just sure. right, that, we, that I think it's really important to to build into your assessment when you're going to do the next assessment. And yeah. That, and that involves yeah. some understanding of sort of the, you know, the statistical power. OK, like I'm going to I'm going to uh, commit to this for a week. It's only yeah. you know, the same as like when they're doing the hydroxychloroquine tests or any any sort of test where you're unsure of the outcome. You don't mm. just say, hey, this guy got cured. Let's give it to everyone. Right. Mm. Then you're sort of you're sort of lurching around. So be able to say, like, here is I think right now I need to do more meditating. And like this morning, I, I went for a six mile run that turned into mostly a six mile walk. I yeah. ended up, um, you know, doing about a mile of that was just hiking over over brush in the woods. And like, sure. oh, that's what felt right today. Yeah. Um, but, you know, but then to be able to say, like, when how do I decide? Because at any given moment, I'll always take chocolate over exercise. Sure. Yeah, that's the that's the yeah, that's that's the tension, I think, is that good habits pay off in the long run. Right. When you build a good habit, you see the payoff eventually. But bad habits pay off mm. immediately. Right. When you eat a piece of chocolate, you get the rush of sugar, you get the endorphins, you, you get the little brain payoff and it pays off immediately. So, again, we're not evolutionarily well set up for for good long term habits a lot of the time. Right. So we the bad habits can trick us into needing relief. And, and that's kind of what's happening a lot of the time now, I think, is that it's people aren't planning to slob out and they're not planning to eat badly. Right. Or they're not really taking an active decision. But there's that thing that inaction is also action, right? This, mm -hmm. you know, not thinking about it, putting that decision off until we reopen or until I go back to work and be like, OK, well, maybe next week or on Monday I'll start again, you know, and then Monday comes around. It's just a rough day at the beginning. You're like, all yeah, right, next Monday, you know, and it keeps getting pushed out further and further and further. And in the meantime, you're accruing these these, these deficits, right? These behavior deficits where you're, you're allowing yourself to go further and further down the hole um, and for, put on more and more weight and get further and further away from the kind of the, the willpower choices that you want and all of those kinds of things. Um, and it is tricky. Yeah, something about that, um, setting the time as well, setting the, the intent to not just check in with yourself, but, but even to do the things, right? I, I found that this is really, really important for me, right? I I like to think of myself as somebody who's very self-disciplined, whatever that means in the wider neurological scope of things, right? Um, but I found even in the first, I, I had an instinct in, in the first couple of weeks of this that a lot of things were going to fall off. And I've been eating more cookies and that kind of stuff. You know, that's my, that's my go-to is the comfort foods a lot of the time. I'll just eat sweet foods. Uh -huh. um, and so I kind of, I did two things. One of them was, <laughs> I'm going to exercise enough strength wise. I'm going to like keep myself moving bodily enough that the surplus of cookies at least might go to my lats <laughs> and, it's, and shoulders more than it's going to go directly to the rest of the thing. Right. And I know that's not a, a direct equation metabolically and all that kind of stuff. But in my mind, I was like, OK, I think I'm probably going to eat more cookies and I'm going to be kind to myself in the sense that, you know, I'm realistically, I'm not going to avoid the cookies and stay on like a, a strict whole foods, plant-based diet with, with paleo foods or whatever it's going to be, you know, um, throughout the, just the duration of this thing. I'm like, my kids are going to be eating cookies. My wife's going to be eating cookies. I'm going to be eating cookies. That's going to happen. So, but I have to try and cap the total number of cookies. And then I have to do things to attempt to offset that health wise. And then the other thing that I did was 
I immediately started doing, I always do morning breath work anyway. I get up in the morning, I do like 15 minutes to half an hour of um, breathing, embodiment, Feldenkrais type exercises, um, exercises from the Russian martial arts Sistema that we both train um, to kind of put your nervous system on the lower boil um, to open up joints that have become stiff and tense with kind of flinch responses that come with being sympathetically activated for days and days on end um, to kind of remind yourself could redownload the programs of mobility that make you feel more kind of full of life and make you feel more like going for a run later or doing something physical later as opposed to the the down spiral of doing nothing feeling stiff and then being like i'm stiff i'm not going to go for a run right all those things and I, i've done that really really well for years and years on end but i i saw at the beginning of this thing i skipped a couple of days right i was just like yeah i'll just i'll do it at 12 because i don't have to jump up and go to work i'm like yeah. i'll do it at noon and then at noon the kids were doing something i was trying to help out i felt bad for not being more helpful around the house and it got pushed for a couple of days so right away i, I started live streaming my breathwork classes like that following monday i skipped it two days i think and on the monday i'm like right that's it and so between 6 30 and 7 30 usually every day it's not an exact time but i'll get up i'll start live streaming and i'll do 15 to 30 minutes of breath work movement and i'll just narrate it and i started live streaming that for everybody on our facebook page closed facebook page for our members so that they would do it some of them would do it along with me now i don't think i have tons and tons of regular viewers on this thing but for me it's an implementation intention i'm like mm -hmm. i i made a promise to I'm pretending I've, that other people are depending on me so that I don't skip it, right? It's like yeah, I, I'm the, holding myself accountable. I just yeah, keep it's the, going. It's the buddy system, right? If, if you know yeah. someone else is waiting in the rain, you'll get up and meet them and go run. Yeah, and, and that's quite important right now because there's no if, – if you haven't got a buddy in the house, like my wife and I can't mm -hmm. go for a run at the same time because we have two small kids, right? Mm -hmm. So we have to alternate our exercise and that kind of stuff, right? I, had, I don't have a buddy holding me accountable, so I had to create one right in my head i had the the collective buddy of all the people that i used to train one-to-one -one and that kind of stuff and and some people are finding it really helpful when they check in every single day and they do every day most people aren't but i don't care i'm going to continue doing it because it's a useful implementation intention for me right it, it stops me falling off the wagon even for a day yeah so a, cu a couple of things about that one is uh, there's a metaphor that uh, my business partner josh likes to use when people talk when people come and confess to him that i've had a bad couple of weeks and it's, yeah. his metaphor is the ratchet wrench mm. that if you never have a bad couple of weeks, you constantly have a voice in your head wondering when it's all going to fall apart. Mm. Right. But when you like the, the having a bad couple of weeks is actually a gift because when you mm. recover from that, you have a, a cellular level of confidence yeah. that, oh, I can I can I am resilient. Right. I yeah. can bounce back. And so it's just like it's like that wrench where you, after a while, you you know, you can't push, but you can go the other way. It'll ratchet and then it gives you mm. more leverage and torque. Yeah. When moving, moving forward. So, you know, yeah. so not not to go into a, a period of two weeks and saying, well, this is going to be a two weeks that I'm going to like it doesn't work that way. But mm. once once you find yourself in it to pull yourself out and say, this is um, this is the opportunity. This is. This is how I become resilient by sinning and repenting as opposed to yeah. never, never taking a step off the line. Yeah, that's a, I think that's a really that's an excellent analogy. It's a it's a, something else jumps out to me about that is that um, one, if you do have to get back into something, the ratchet wrench implies that you take tiny steps, a few at like you just crank a bit of time. You're not going to get to move it the the bolt through 180 degrees after having <laughs> got stopped dead, right? You have to go like oh, okay, two degrees now, three degrees now. Three degrees. So to get yourself back in might be a little bit of a fight, but as you start to get hope that the thing is moving, <laughs> then you get some semblance of momentum, and by those tiny little steps, maybe you'll be back up to running for like half an hour, or you know or keeping yourself on the straight and narrow with nutrition before you know it. But you're probably not going to get back there by jumping back in well, at the same level that you left two weeks ago, right? Yeah, you, you, you're ego. not going to have so Yeah, that's right. ego. And that's also the part of you that wants to just binge and be lazy is going to mm. is going to commandeer and say, hey, you know, you lifted 350 pounds the last time you deadlifted four years ago. Like you should yeah. be able to do that. Yeah, right. It's yeah, another, that's a surprisingly common thing of yeah. you know, just being sensitive to reality. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Ahead. No. Yeah. No. I, I I think that's a very very common thing. I've seen a lot of people fall off the wagon physically with um you know physical training and martial arts training and some of the things that I'm involved in. And and 
I suspect, I mean, not all the time, but a good number of the people that I've talked to by inference, their reasons for not getting back into it. Sometimes they'll try other things, you know, they'll get into yoga, they'll do something else. Um, and the real reason why they're not getting back into this is that they just hate that they can't do what it what they used to be able to do, right? They're like, oh, you know, it's just, it'll be such an on-ramp. I'll have to relearn all of these things. And in martial arts, it's like, you you know, there's a feel to these things. It's like a musical instrument or a language. If you don't use it for a while, you get really, really rusty. The skills are still in there, but they don't come back right away. You have to kind of crank your way back in. You need some contact. You need some pressure. You need to be reminded what it's like to respond quickly to somebody else moving, right? It's not just like lifting weights on your own. So there is, there's a fall off, right? There's a, there's a refractory period. You jump back and it takes time to get back in again. And that takes, that takes some commitment to, to go through the suck and be like, you know, uh, this is not fun right now. And it's not fun feeling like I can't, even do a pull-up. I mean, I, I had an injury. Um, I had a, what I thought was an, a hernia actually like, earlier on in the year. Um, and that even my doctor diagnosed it. He's pretty sure it was a hernia. Every time I like, sneezed or coughed, it was very, very painful, like the groin region, all that kind of stuff. Um, and then I was on the verge of driving to DC to get surgery from a, a specialist up there and talk to the surgeon. He's like, I've been doing this 25 years and I'll put money on it that that's not actually a hernia. He goes, I think you've torn a few muscles in your groin or torn, and that like it's going to take months to heal. Um, and he said, you're worried about it now because it's been months and it's not healing. But I'm, I'm, sa- I'm telling you, give it another three months. And if it still hasn't healed, then I'll talk to you again. But I don't want to operate on you because I'm fairly sure that it won't fix the problem. Right. He goes, maybe you have like a small hernia, but that's not what's causing your pain. You've also torn groin muscles. right? Oh, <laughs> so he's like, you know, he's, he's, so he said, give it three months. And and it hurt and I couldn't do um, anything that involved raising my legs, which is tough in Sistema. And, you know, hanging from things was really, really difficult, like doing pull-ups, things like that as it was stretching everything out. And and it was debilitating and a bit humiliating, you know. I was like, oh, man, I was this person who was very strong and very agile and all this kind of stuff. And now I'm back to kind of square one, like training some of my 60-year-old personal training students or something. That's kind of how I felt. Um, but I kind of t- chipped away at it, did little bits, and I did what I could, and I moved around it. Um, and then three months later, almost without realizing, it's gone. You know, it, it healed. Mm-hmm. But it, it didn't I, – I can't remember the point at which I didn't get any pain, but now I can do, you know, handstand push-ups and all kinds of weird stuff that would have been impossible three months ago. But just through a slow period of – keeping small commitments and being like, all right, what can I do? Right. And just every day being like, what can I do? I can't do these. What can I do? And got me back to a place where I was, I had good momentum again. Right. And I see a lot of people fall off for that reason because they they don't want to go back to, they don't want to fail. They don't want to come back in and see what they look like right now, you know, and revisit that ground. Yeah. So what, you know, if you, if the, the big structural problem is bad habits feel good now, Mm. and good habits feel good later. What did you do to front load the good feeling? Or did you just override the bad feeling? Like, was was there a way in which you were able to derive pleasure from, okay, I'm making these small steps, and I'm moving towards the thing that I want? Yeah, I think for me, it was, and this is going to sound really boring. um, But but for me, it was metrics. It's like a little bit, it's tracking. It's like, Mm. Uh, the, the depression of like not being able to do a single pull up, for example, or a single leg raise being like, all right, that's terrible. I don't want that. I want to be able to do 120 again. Right. But let's be realistic here. I can't do 120. So doing some modified version where my feet are on a chair and I'm doing half a pull up and lowering myself down or lying on my back and just lifting my knees up and just trying to find all right, what's possible. What can I do without pain? What's not going to be making it worse? And then saying, can I do five of those? And then the next week, just adding 10 percent every week mm. you know just a, a small increment going from five of those to like six of those and then from six of those to eight and then eight of those and then it starts to open up you get kind of this compound interest effect where you do lots and lots of tiny additions at 10 percent, but after a while 10 percent added to 10 percent starts to take off and then before you know it you're doing you know like 20 half pull-ups and then like w- within like a couple of months and then you can look back over your thing and be like oh wow I used I couldn't even do three of those and now I'm back up to doing five full pull ups right and all that kind of mm-hmm. stuff. So seeing because I think that problem between the again, the remembering and the experiencing self, even when you start to do something, you take it for granted and you forget where you've come from. But if you can just use use some metrics and then kind of track it over time and be g- deliberately kind of underachieve and do small steps along the way, then at least you're seeing some sort of forward momentum. Right. If, but otherwise, kind of if you try and do it kind of 
experientially and be like, how does this feel? Often you can be like, it feels just as shitty as yesterday, right? <laughs> so, you know, and you don't see any net improvement in yourself. But the but the metrics, if you if you measure them properly, won't lie. And I think you've used this argument before for you know weighing yourself every day, even if you're not trying to lose weight. You know, you can at least see something. You know, you can see you've got information to work on, whether you ignore it or not. Yeah. Mm. That's mm. really interesting when you talked about you know the metrics because well, I think what we really get addicted to in a positive way is improvement. Yeah. And so like one of the challenges of being at the top of your game is mm. that you have to be much more focused and committed because the improvements don't come very often. Right? Yeah. Like if you're studying martial art, the first six months, you're making tremendous progress when you start learning a language. You know, yeah. you, it's you know, this the, the learning curve is very, very steep at the beginning. And then yeah. as you become a master, it might take you 10 years to get slightly better at a takedown. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So that when you when you find yourself back at the bottom, instead of just comparing yourself to what you've lost, if you focus on met, if you focus on, I guess, the 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 calculus, right? I can't remember the the, the integration under the curve or whatever of but sure. of, of your acceleration as opposed yeah. to your absolute position, you can then get addicted to being a beginner again. Yeah, and I think another thing that does is that it makes you focus more on your everyday process and less on the goal, right? Everybody always talks about goal setting. Like I've got this goal of losing this much weight. I have this goal of doing 100 push-ups. I have this goal of being a calm person who never shouts at his wife or his kids, you know, mm -hmm. or whatever it's going to be. You know, it's like they have this. I'm going to go to this goal, this goal, this goal. And then every time you fail to reach that goal or some semblance of it, right? You can't do half of those um imagined goal metrics or something like that then you just prove to yourself that you're still not that person right if you're overly focused on goals i think that's where it gets and i think if you're injured or you're recovering from something or you're coming back from a period of loss or grief or just abject apathy or whatever it's going to be which is a lot of people are right now right if you focus too much on the goal of getting back to where you were or you know making x amount of money or losing x amount of weight whatever it is sometimes it can be disheartening to get started and, and just see that you're not making much progress towards that goal, right? If you're constantly measuring how far you've gone against his, how far I have to go, you can look at that road, road ahead and be like, oh man, yeah. really? You know, like, and you can fall off the wagon just for, and then again, the experiencing self creeps back in and you look at the cookie and you look at Netflix and you're like, eh, yeah, maybe not today. I'll, I'll give it another crack tomorrow. Right. But, so if you're too focused on that destination, it's you, you don't enjoy the process at all. But I think what the metrics allowed me to do is, despite myself to focus on i'm going to enjoy these two half crappy pull-ups right <laughs> i'm going to i'm going to experience the crap out of these two pull-ups and just feel every muscle and feel everything that's firing everything that's not firing identify what's going right what's going wrong and be like i'm going to do these perfectly right i can't mm -hmm. do those but i can do these perfectly and then be like all right that's what i'm doing today and then tomorrow i'm going to do that again and i'm not even going to think about being able to do 120 pull-ups i'm just going to see if i can nudge like do these today right um and the analogy in martial arts is that they use a lot of the time in traditional martial arts, when you have colored belts, you know, that grade you all the way up. If you're constantly thinking about your next belt, you're like, I want to be a brown belt. I want to be a black belt. Um, then typically you're not focusing on the things that you need to do to get squared away where you are in order to pass your grading and get an amount of skill or beat somebody else at your level in a match so that you can actually get graded and go up. So the, um, the advice that's typically given is like, if you're a blue belt, your job is to be the most skilled the most efficient, you know, the the most skilled blue belt that you can be. And then when, when that happens, naturally, somebody will be like, oh, you're a brown belt now. No, and they move you up. Right? right. But if you focus on trying to be a brown belt, you're, you're almost jumping ahead of where you are and you you're not embodying where you are right now. And I think there's a lesson in that, a wider lesson in that. Yeah, I, lo I love that. And I'm wondering how you can apply that to um, o omitted behaviors. So like doing a pull up is a positive, mm. you can keep track of it, you can have a spreadsheet, you can break it down into goals. But if the yeah. goal is eating less cookies, or mm -hmm. not drinking or not binge watching Netflix, right? So to like, because I'm, what I'm seeing with a lot of my clients is they're doing great with a lot of things, but then at a certain point, their their stress response overwhelms them, they have some sort of, you know, trauma in their past, and who doesn't? Yeah, uh, whether it's big T trauma or little T trauma or ordinary life, you know, slings and arrows trauma. Yeah. And 
um, you know, sort of intensified by the current pandemics and lockdowns and all that. But mm. how, how do you help people uh, who are trying to be good by mm. avoiding behaviors when the stress in their bodies is driving them? And so no matter what plans they make or what intentions they set, yeah. the, the stress is overwhelming them. Yeah, I think that's an excellent question um, and it really gets to the root of it. The conventional response when you look at kind of health coaching or habit formation to that kind of thing, like how do you avoid a negative behavior, right? How do you avoid self-sabotage is um, create a friction cost, right? Is like create obstacles, like throw all the cookies out of the house, just don't have them in the in the, in the pantry, you know, um, I don't know, put an app on your phone that limits your Facebook use to 15 minutes a day or whatever it's going to be. That's the conventional approach. Um, but our approach that we take in Stress Proof and in Systema and in the coaching that I do is that that's not really going to help if your body is still kind of in a fight or flight mode or even in a shutdown mode, right, where it's where it's just kind of got some helplessness about it um, or it feels like it needs to still fight to survive, right? Because what will happen is you'll just find ways of circumventing those obstacles, right? You know, if you empty the pantry, you'll go out and buy all new cookies, right? If you, th if you, you know, threw away all your porn, <laughs> you go get more porn. I don't know. Whatever the, you know, whatever your thing is, right? All that kind of stuff is then you'll find a way to get back out. Or if you have an por app. Porno cookies, cookies with, with <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> erotic images on them. There's a marketing idea for you. There you go. Um, but or if you set an app, you know that kind of thing. I I, I tried this with one of my friends who remain uh, remain nameless, and I was like, yeah, I've got this great app. It's I'm testing it for my tech proof course and trying to help people put pick their phone up less often. You put it, you know, put it on there, and it grows trees when you leave it alone. When you pick it up, the tree just dies, right? That's kind of like a little animation. Mm -hmm. And there's another one that shuts you down and only gives you like 15 minutes of access to you know facebook social media instagram whatever it's going to be and that's it he's like yeah this is great for like a week or two he was like yeah this is great i can see how this is working and then after two weeks i'm like how are you going he's like yeah i just opened it in another browser or i just <laughs> i picked up my ipad and just just used something else to get around the, the app like he's got the thing there and he won't remove it and he doesn't take it off because in principle it's there and it's, it's supposed to be the obstacle but it's not going around so you gotta ask yourself what's the driver for that behavior what's making you feel like it's going to be more beneficial um, to cheat and to um, circumvent these obstacles that you've set up for yourself or to circumvent these rules that you kind of know are going to be good strategically in the long term. Um, what's driving you towards that? And I think you're quite right to point out that stress makes us feel bodily like we're in need of relief. Um, we're bodily in need of um, touch, of pressure, of kind of like quick sustenance, um, of comfort, right? And so we're in this kind of search for comfort all of the time right um and we're trying to kind of satiate ourselves not just um metabolically right we're not just trying to put enough food in that we're no longer feeling hunger and all that kind of stuff but we're trying to satiate our kind of hunger for human contact and we're trying to satiate our hunger for having purpose right and a lot of these are things are dropping away right now right people who have are unable to work have lost part of their identity right and people who are unable to see you know my kids can't hug their grandparents you know because they're in the high risk group for this thing and so they're not even even social distancing get togethers are, are risky for them you know that kind of stuff and and there's a real sense of loss in that and i think our stress responses are trying to take up the slack and they're trying to do the best thing that they can right it's the thing that they've been tuned for hundreds of thousands if not millions of years to do is to be like all right let me help you out with this you should definitely do this you should definitely stuff a bunch of sugary stuff in because there's a famine going on and we need, we need to make this work or you should you know um placate yourself on an intellectual level by experiencing emotions that somebody else is having by passively watching a netflix movie that makes you terrified or excited or sad or maybe browse social media to try and bring yourself up to the level of kind of internal anger and anxiety that you already feel right so you're basically browsing news news stories looking for one that kind of makes you angry so that you can justify how you or how angry you already feel and lost uh -huh. right you, you literally keep scrolling until you find one you know for that reason so once you identify that then you realize that no amount of goal setting no amount of obstacle creation is going to get you into those processes and choices that are good if you ignore what's going on inside the body so for me and for the people that I coach and work with, I've, I've made 
self-regulation paramount, right? Uh, that ability to understand what's going on inside our bodies, to spot those first few little snowballs of stress coming down the slope before they become an avalanche that makes us swamps us and puts us into bad choices and to, to kind of redirect them to kind of reset your nervous system and to bring yourself back to a place where your body doesn't feel panicked anyway and this is difficult it, you know it's difficult work it, it's not necessarily done even with 10 or 20 minutes of meditation right meditation will take you into a certain state and it can make you feel more mindful and it can make you feel more embodied and at one with the world but within 10 minutes like after meditating scrolling some facebook you'll be right your body will be right back to where it was yeah, right well, I've, so had, it's, I've had meditations lately where after like 10 minutes in someone's making a noise and i'm just like will you shut the fuck up <laughs> like oh <laughs> i guess that didn't work <laughs> yeah seriously yeah so like the opposite of the uh, of the bell that calls you to relaxation right <laughs> just shout at the bell every time it goes off um but yeah I th so that this self-regulation work and especially in the absence of the ability to co-regulate right we used to get some co-regulation from socialization from talking to friends and we can go on zoom and we can do these things and all those things help right i'm, I'm not saying that we shouldn't attempt to stay socially connected even though we're socially isolated but it's not the same it's not the same as face-to-face body-to-body skin-to-skin human contact with hugs and abrazos and handshakes and all of the things that go with it right um so, so what, if we what, have if, you if you have a small def yeah. define co-regulation so co-regulation is something that all mammals do in order to keep themselves um feeling safe and and feeling reassured and and feeling sociable right and so you, you, the simplest example is a mother comforting a baby, right, with physical touch, right? The baby gets stressed out, maybe it rolls out of its crib or something, arches its back, and it goes into kind of a stress response or that kind of stuff. The mother doesn't stand by the baby going like, you need to calm down. You should just get your shit together, baby. <laughs> <laughs> just set some gold. Don't cry so much, right? <laughs> but it's, it's, it sounds ridiculous, but like, nobody would think that would work, right? But we pick the baby up instead. We hold it close to our chest, and the baby can feel your heartbeat. You can feel its heartbeat. There's some entrainment between your physical state and um, the slowness of your breathing, the depth of your breathing, the slowness of um, your heart rate and um, how easy your blood pressure and how easy it's spread out, right? The baby feels all of that, hears all the noises, feels all the touch, even smells you right close up. And that's what calms the baby down, right? And yeah, you can jiggle and you can rock and you can do other little tricks, but it's ultimately that physical contact and the baby feeling reassured by your body language and your signals that calms it down. Now, at a certain point, for some reason, a lot of parents go off the wagon with that, right? They're, they're like, okay, you do that for a baby and you do that for a two-year-old, but a seven-year-old should just get his shit together, right? Mm -hmm. you, you should be like, come on, you're not, you're, you're not a baby. You should get yourself together. Instead of when they're upset or they're crying or they're angry because you've taken the iPad away or whatever it's going to be, right? Instead of being like, okay, just come here, right? Let's, let's, de let's regulate your body first. Let's get your body to a place where you're not anxious and angry and all those things. And then we can maybe start talking about it, right? You have to engage with the nervous system, get it on the low boil, and then you can engage the higher brain and you can start reasoning and planning and all that kind of mm -hmm. stuff, right? Um, for some reason, people let go of that and they definitely let go of it with other adults, right? And often we'll try and talk other people out of things or try and give them advice when what they really need is a hug, right? Or what they really need is for you to be with them, just have a hand on their shoulder and just be there, you know, experiencing mm -hmm. the world with them and feeling what they're feeling for a little bit and then, but also being a solid sense of support. So co-regulation is something that all mammals do, right? Um, and self-regulation is the ability to do that to yourself to feel your own system almost as if you're someone else right that you're experience you're looking at your body and being like oh that can't be right right mm -hmm. <laughs> you kind of roll your eyeballs back in your head and you, you turn your attention internally instead of externally towards the causes of the behavior and you say okay my heart rate's too high my neck is very very tense um my guts feel kind of out of order i feel like there's a whole bunch of signals here which indicate that i'm in the grip of a stress response and then having tools to unwind that and right. to pull apart the physical tension so, to slow down your heart rate to redirect blood pressure so that self-regulation uh, is something you have to do to yourself first and then co-regulation right. is something that you can do with other people right? uh-huh and so when you're basically saying i'm in the grip of a stress response what you're saying is my internal symptomology or my experience of my body doesn't match what I perceive in the outside world. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, there's a dissonance between what your body thinks it's doing and what's going on outside. Yeah. Okay. So do you have a couple of, you know, quick tips that people can start doing when they when they, you know, I guess number one is start to pay attention. 
on some yeah. sort of regular basis so that you know what healthy baseline is when you're not under immediate physical threat? Yeah, I think I think um, my general advice is usually est establish and reestablish your baseline at least once a day, right? So when you get up in the morning, don't start checking Facebook, like reading for the new updates on coronavirus or whatever Trump said or whatever it's going to be, right? Don't start the day like that and just fire yourself up with all the things that are going wrong with the world, right? Um, make your routine to get up, um, go outside, take in some natural fractals and green light wavelengths, all of these things that tend to calm us down anyway. And there's a lot of research on forest therapy and stuff like that that shows that even 15 minutes in a forest environment or a leafy outdoor environment, if you have access to it, right? If you're in an urban area, you have to make do with parks or you have to get a lot of pot plants or whatever else is going on. But even 15 minutes of looking at and just not meditating, not having any skills, just being around those environments can downregulate your nervous system and, and even upregulate uh, immune cells for the next three days, right? And some persist for six weeks. If you're like an hour or two out in the forest for six weeks afterwards, you have a heightened, um, more powerful immune response and you have lower vagal tone, right? You're better able to respond to stresses and that kind of stuff. So get outside first thing in the morning and then come back in or stay out in nature, depending on where you are and just either sit or lay down and just do nothing. Like don't try and meditate. Don't try and think about what it is that you've got to do. Don't try and solve any of the problems, economic, financial, global, whatever it is that you think you might have to do. Just lay there and do nothing for like a good 10 minutes. Like a good 10 minutes, just allow yourself to do that and then see if you can pay attention to the breathing. And obviously I do this in a lot of meditation and mindfulness practices, but don't do it with a view to getting better at breathing right? Mm -hmm. Or improving the way that you breathe, just watch it for a while, see what it's doing, right? And see where your baseline is. And then do the same thing with your pulse rate. And then what you can start to do a very, very simple technique um, is to feel the pulse wherever it is in the body, whether it's in the chest, or whether it's in your abdomen, or whether it's in your throat or your head, um, which you don't want for a long period of time, but that might be where you start, right? Um, and then you start to inhale for three pulse beats, and then exhale for three pulse beats, right? So you entrain your breathing to what your current heart rate is, right? So in, doom, doom, out, doom, doom, right? Um, and then you can start to a little bit lead what your heart rate is doing, right? It's typically autonomic. It has its own kind of, um, has its own pacemaker and it's doing its own thing. It beats without you asking it to, thankfully, right? Um, but what you can do is you can kind of mentally drag that a little bit. So you inhale for three pulse beats, exhale for three. And then once you feel like you're in synchrony with it and you know what it's doing, you can you can kind of talk to your heart a little bit and be like, let's try a little bit slower. Let's try one, two, three. So it's a bit like a like a flam when you're drumming, right? Instead of being like tip tap, tip tap, you go tip right? You just kind of go a little bit, lag it behind the beat a little bit, make, make it make your heartbeat a little bit more bluesy, right? Just hang out behind the note, and just let it go that way. And just to, if you do it just a tiny bit behind where it is, you'll see, especially on the exhale, that it starts to come down very, very quickly and starts to your heart rate starts to come down, the whole blood pressure starts to come down um, and you establish like a new baseline, right? And then spend a few minutes just breathing that way, relaxing, watching your new baseline. And then try and remember what that state feels like, the state of heaviness, of relaxation, of fullness of breathing, of synchrony between your breathing and the amount of effort you're exerting, right? All of those kinds of things. And then see if you can do that at least once more during the day. So maybe after lunch, lay down, do that. Um, maybe again at like 7 p.m. Or for me, it's like 9 p.m. after I put the kids down. There's like a scramble of mm -hmm. bath time and all those things. And there's always like a, some pressure in, in getting that done. And every parent knows that feeling of, <sighs> a lot of relief after the kids are you know down and asleep all that kind of stuff so after that i take some time to lie down and instead of going straight to the netflix and be like boo when you're still kind of a little bit activated and trying to rely on some external thing to calm you down you reestablish your baseline and you're like where am i at and then you just let it all fall into place so even without like very specific skills in meditation or body work or other things which you can apply of course and if you have a like a practice like that then keep doing it if yoga works for you keep doing it all of those things and um, but even in the absence of those things just checking in with yourself two or three times a day as as woolly and woo woo as it sounds is probably the single most important skill that we can exhibit right now it's more important than cranking out pull-ups it's more important than setting goals on diet even i think at the moment mm -hmm. right and then that established then your nervous system is in enough balance 
that you can start to think about making good decisions or you can start making plans and trust your body to respond to them. But the entire time that your body's on this high sympathetic nervous system boil, it's, it's going to be very, very hard to trust it to do what it wants. It's the, it's the elephant and rider, right? The elephant is still scared. The elephant is still uncomfortable. And so it's going to grab a few cookies off the trees, those, those well-known cookie trees in Africa, which we know grow everywhere. Um, and it's going to do what makes it happy in the short term, right? So you've got to calm the elephant down if you want it to do anything else. Yeah. Yeah. I think the the, uh, the cookie trees are probably the fermented cookie trees. These yeah, days. for the elephants. Yeah. Um, yeah. So what this reminds me of is the idea of like cleaning the kitchen sink. Right. Mm. Like if you always have dirty dishes in the sink, they're just going to pile up. Yeah. But if you clean the sink three times a day, like after every meal and you come in, and your sink is clean, then it's much easier to keep it clean. Yeah. Not only is it much easier, but it also to your earlier point about confidence and achievement and resilience, it teaches you that you're the sort of person that has a clean sink right? Mm -hmm. right. instead of you're the sort of person that typically has like three days of mold growing on the plate and <laughs> a bunch of pop tarts hanging around, stuff like that. Right. And then if you see that day in day out, then you're like, OK, that's a big difference. Like it's, I think it's a military expression, which is like make your damn bed or something like that. The, yeah. the first thing you do is make your bed every morning. Then it, it sets an intention, right? It's just like this is how I go through life. This is squared away. I'm coming back to this later. I'm not planning on going back to this bed at any time between now and then. So why would I leave it all scruffy and open like I'm trying to get back in again? You know. Um, so right. yeah. So I we're back. We're back to Jocko. Yeah. <laughs> Damn it. He's right. Yeah. <laughs> nice. Yeah. No, that's beautiful because when you think about it, like that's that's our foundation. Yeah. Is our like we think it's our intellect is our foundation, but our foundation is our nervous system. Because mm. your your intellect is not going to, like you know it's, as you said it's the elephant and the rider. The elephant yeah. is so much more powerful. Yeah. Um, right. And that's that is essentially our nervous system, our vagal turn, uh, vagal tone. Um, like everything else we do is sort of window dressing that we then rationalize. Yeah. After with, the fact, after yes. the fact with thought. So I, I, I love that. I love how simple it is. And I love yeah. that for so many people, you've given us something to not do like instead sure. of the Facebook scrolling, like I'll get up in the morning and I'll pick up the phone and, you know, Facebook, Twitter, New York Times, Washington Post, The Guardian. Yeah. And 45 minutes later, I'm pissed off at the world and yeah. I still haven't doused or stretched sure. or yeah. done anything useful. Yeah, I, th I think one and again, it's those simple little measures sometimes. And this here's where like the obstacles idea can come in handy. One of the most valuable things you can do with your phone is buy a bread bin. Right. And, and cut a hole in the back of it, put the phone in the damn bread bin like at night before you go to bed. And maybe you can have a charger in it if you really want to put a you know, charging hole through there. But that's where it lives. It doesn't go to the bedroom with you. Right. Mm -hmm. And people are like, oh, I need an alarm clock. It's like buy an alarm clock. Right. Have a watch. It's, it's not that hard. It's not that bad. Right. If you keep the phone by you in case you need the alarm clock, the one function that it has, then unfortunately, it also has the entire world in there, including all of the bad news that's going on. And the chances of you being. I know, disciplined enough and psychologically relaxed enough to not want to check what's going on with the entire world, either right before bed or right when you get up. I mean, the chances are, are pretty low that you're going to stay away from that, right? Yeah. Especially if you've been doing it for a couple of months, if that's your habit. So you have to you have to take a bit more of a, a measure and just assert your dominance over the machine. It doesn't live you. It doesn't rule you, right? It, it really doesn't. It's funny. I watched um, Jerry Seinfeld's uh, on a complete tangent. Jerry Seinfeld's mm -hmm. new Netflix special. I think it was called like something like a. 28 hours to go or something like that. I watched it last night and it, and it was excellent. You know, he's, he's getting on a bit and he's he's slowing down with his wits slightly and that kind of stuff, right, with the, with the speed of delivery. But it's still excellent observational comedy. And um, and he said he he gave this uh, example. He said, sometimes I wonder if like uh, if, if the phone is the pimp. <laughs> and, and uber uber is the hoe and i'm just like the john getting fun funneled around pretty much it's like i'm carrying the phone it's basically finding ways to get me to transport the phone to new places all the time he's like you can't give the phone to somebody else you want to show them something you hand it to them for like 10 seconds and be like yeah all right you've seen it now give it back give it back you know it's like everybody's like that anxious about not knowing which pocket the phone is in um that clearly that these things are our overlords and we're just here to shuttle them around via uber and things that it controls the money for now as well right so uh, so we're being pimped out by our phones apparently so i thought that was a good analogy so yeah um cut the pimp you can you can do this by yourself so take the phone put it in the bread bin leave it there and then get up go outside do whatever you douse meditate do whatever pray whatever your morning routine is going to be right then go get the phone from the bread bin and real life can reassert itself right but at least give yourself that time even if it's only 15 minutes before 
Trump, the you know, COVID, the entire world's arguments about what we should do about it come rushing back in again. Beautiful. All right. Nice. I think that's, that's, good. that's going to be helpful for, for coaches who are working with the uh, with clients who are um, stuck. And it's I think it's helpful for all of us who have human bodies and need to get through this. So thank you. Well, no, thank you very much, Ben. It's uh, benefit a lot from your insights too. So. All right, catch you later. Yep, stay healthy. You See too. ya.